are all set. Welcome to Both Sides of the Story. I'm your host, Alan Janae from CBS4. Thank you for joining us tonight. Our special high school debate series returns, challenging our students and our viewers to look at important Colorado issues from both sides. Each student will offer a case, ask and answer questions of their opponent, and offer rebuttal. We'll also feature an expert judging panel that will chime in with questions of their own. Now, both students have prepared a pro and a con case for tonight's debate topic, and they won't know which side they'll defend until we have a coin flip right here in our studio. Now, we have added a brand new element this year I want you to know about. A winner will be chosen from each school, then we'll go on to compete in the semifinals, and then we will ultimately name a both sides of the story champ. Be sure and watch throughout the season as each of our winners is named and they move on through the tournament. Now, tonight's program features students from St. Mary's High School speech and debate team. For the last 12 consecutive years, St. Mary's has had one or more students qualify for the national speech and debate tournament. Only the top 3% of competitors in the country qualify for that national tournament. Let's meet our participants. First, we have Colton Barda. He is a senior and a Lincoln Douglas debater at St. Mary's and is a state and national qualifier. When he's not doing speech and debate, he runs cross country and he plays guitar. Next, we have Cole Rickey. He is also a senior, and this is his fourth year on the St. Mary's team as a U.S. extemper. He is a two-time state qualifier, and when he is not debating, he's a semi-professional gamer. We also have a special panel of experts who will offer their analysis of our debate. They are Dominic Dizzuti, host of Colorado Decides, the election debate series produced in conjunction with CBS4, and Jeff Bortz, the head speech and debate coach at St. Mary's High School. And next to him is team assistant Tom Wall. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Before we get started with our first debate, let's hear from Colton about how competing on this team helps him flex his intellectual muscles. Really the entire point of forensics is to have intellectual conversation, just in one way to another can communicate intellectual ideas, either about what should be happening with politics or a struggle somebody's going through in a poem or just how we look at the world and what we find funny is funny. And when you're able to have an intellectual conversation, it just, it opens your minds, just not to your own viewpoint and really taking a mirror to yourself and what you really think, but to other people's viewpoints. It's helped me to become a more rounded person. Well, Colton says he's considering attending NYU or Yale to study chemical engineering next year. Now, Cole will share some insights on what participating on this team has taught him. I joined the speech and debate team to kind of come out of my shell. I was a very shy kid when I came in my freshman year, and it really helped me to learn to speak publicly and it helps me gain a lot of friends. A lot of the things that I'm learning are how to speak to people, how to interact with them, how to respect their beliefs, and in, a, in the world today, that's extremely important. The most valuable thing that I've developed being part of this team is my friendships. Uh, when I got here, I was very nervous. I didn't want to talk to anybody, but then the St. Mary's community plus the forensics team really welcomed me, and I felt comfortable around everybody. Cole tells us he's considering Notre Dame or Northwestern in the fall to study history next year. All right, time to set our ground rules. Let's do it. Each side will present their case, ask each other questions, and have a chance to offer rebuttals. When it's finished, we'll go to our illustrious panel for their own questions and find out who they felt offered the best arguments. So let's get started. The issue up for debate today is whether Colorado school districts should be allowed to offer vouchers to help families pay for private K-12 through education. Let's have our coin flip right now and get things underway. So, Colton, I'm going to bring you out, and we'll do this coin flip right here. Go ahead and call it. Heads. It is tails, I'm afraid. So, Cole, I'm going to give you the pick. You want pro or you want con? I'd like neck, please. You'd like neck. Okay, very good. Con. All right, Colton, as you will take the positive, you're going to go first. So, you have three minutes. State your case. Sounds good. Thank you. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Nansen Mandela. It's because I concur with the former South African president that I stand resolved. Colorado should allow school districts to offer vouchers for private K-12 through education. Colorado has yet to truly offer effective voucher programs, but other states have, and the evidence is clear. Let me get on to my first point today. School vouchers empirically help graduation rates 
In Washington, D.C., a study by the U.S. Department of Education found that there was a 21% point gap between the graduation rates of those in the voucher program at 91% and those who had applied but failed to win the placement lottery at 70%. A study released late last month by the University of Arkansas School Choice Demonstration Project showed a similar pattern in uh, Milwaukee, with those using the vouchers in the ninth grade graduating at a rate of 77 percent, eight percentage points higher than their peers in public schools at 69 percent. When teens abandon their education, it's not just the teachers who love giving math pop quizzes who lose. It also impacts everyone who wants to see the American economy thrive. For excellent. The Alliance for Excellent Education estimates that if the dropout rate was halved, those expected high school grads would earn an extra $7.6 billion annually. By the midpoint of those students' careers, those extra earnings could add an extra $9.6 billion to the U.S. economy, creating as many as 54,000 jobs. If Colorado frees districts to offer vouchers, we will benefit from the increased graduation rates and enjoy the boost to our economy from more productive workers. But in addition to the economic benefits, there is also a fairness issue. But let's just remember that going forward, that this is not just an issue about Colorado economy. It could also extend to the entire United States economy. But my second point today is school vouchers stop making families pay for more than one school. It's really a no-brainer that competition should be encouraged among schools to improve educational standards and lower the prices of high-quality education, and school vouchers make this possible. Without school vouchers, some families unable to pay for two educational options for their children have to settle for a substandard education. The present system doesn't yield the graduation rates of better schools made possible by these vouchers. Many families are left with only one realistic choice, the nearest local public school. According to the University of Arkansas educational professor Patrick Wolf, a researcher on both the Washington and Milwaukee studies, the overall conclusion of research on vouchers is simple. It's either no significant difference or a positive effect. Wolf's evidence supports the notion that vouchers boost economic outcomes more than the other less controversial reforms, such as class size reductions and additional monitoring. There are no studies that have said these vouchers have a negative impact on students allowing school districts to offer vouchers for K through 12 education. This would be a win for all, the students, the parents, and of all of Colorado. If done correctly, we can expect higher educational standard rates than we have today, increased productivity, and incomes from the greater number of graduates in a fair system where parents pay for one school, a great school of their choice. Thank you. Colton, thank you very much. Okay, Cole, you now have two minutes for questions and cross-examination. Go ahead. All right. Colton, you mentioned that there was a 21% point gap between the graduation rates of those involved in the voucher program and those who were not. What was the graduation rate before the voucher program was introduced? I'm actually unsure of that. Okay, so how can you be sure that the right students who are willing to work are going to get these vouchers? Um, you can't be sure because it's determined by a lottery. Do you think the lottery is the most efficient way to hand out vouchers? No, I definitely think the voucher program needs some work, but as we can see from increased graduation rates and just some improvements here and there, it's definitely something worth continuing and worth working on and definitely not something we should drop. Okay. You also mentioned that if we have the dropout rate, the economy will flourish. Will vouchers do this or should we do something else to also help have the dropout rate? Oh, we should do anything in our power to decrease dropout rates, whatever it may be. But the thing is that this does have significant impacts on the dropout rate, which helps the U.S. economy, which helps all of us. Will the dropout rate also decrease in those that do not win the lottery? Um, no. Okay. So you also mentioned that paying for two schools is unfair. While I agree with you, should we also abandon public schools entirely? No. The voucher program won't lead to the complete abandonment of public schools, as I believe good public schools will stay open, while those public schools that are floundering right now will either see a push for better productivity or they'll get shut down and people will start going to better public schools who need more funding. Considering how long vouchers have been in place in the United States, shouldn't public schools have already done something by now if they were going to? Well, being that vouchers are kind of a state to state thing at right now as we can see it goes from supreme courts and state supreme courts have different ideas we still deserve we still need to give vouchers a chance to really see any real effects so far but the effects we do have are positive ones okay which means it's worth continuing and my last question uh, how would we know what these private schools are doing with the funds that they receive from the vouchers considering that they don't have to show any legal representation of what they do with them Again, the voucher program isn't perfect, but as it is right now, I believe that 
part of the increased productivity of private schools as opposed to public schools is not the strict watching of their records. There definitely needs to be some monitoring, just we'll see what comes. Gentlemen, thank you very much. The question at hand is whether Colorado school districts should be able to offer vouchers to pay for private K through 12 education. Cole, you have the con side. The floor is now yours for three minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. What the best and wisest parents wants for his own child, that must the community want for all of its children. Any other ideal for our schools is narrow and unlovely. Acted upon, it destroys our democracy. John Dewey, educational philosopher, 1907. Because I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Dewey, we must reject the notion of encouraging districts in Colorado to offer educational vouchers for private education. Contention one, Colorado deserves consistent standards for all students. In states where vouchers are in place, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Florida, a two-tiered system has been set up that holds students in public and private schools to different standards. This fact is highlighted very clearly by the National Educators Association. Reform should be based on student achievement and ability, not a random chance for success through trial and error or a lottery in various upstart, unaccountable private schools. Having different tiers of accountability for private schools or no accountability at all means that parents who use vouchers for private schools may have a sense that their children are receiving a type of education they support, yet their children may be far behind or fail to achieve the standards set in public school. Contention two, vouchers only threaten public schools that are not performing instead of helping them improve. Vouchers were not designed to help low-income children. Milton Friedman, the grandfather of vouchers, dismissed the notion that vouchers could help low-income families, saying, it is essential that no conditions be attached to the acceptance of vouchers that interfere with the freedom of private enterprises to experiment. A voucher system would only encourage economic, racial, ethnic, and religious stratification in our society. Colorado's success has been built on our ability to unify our diverse populations through a strong public school system. Vouchers would set up yet another discriminant. Realize that private schools would be under no obligation to accept a student with a voucher if that student does not meet the specific requirements for the school. This is why, in part, the Colorado Supreme Court ruled in 2011 that the vouchers offered by Douglas County School District were contrary to the Colorado Constitution. We should do all we can to strengthen and support the democratic principle of a quality education for all students in Colorado not pull away funds for voucher schemes that do not guarantee Colorado students are held to high standards. Now let me briefly respond to the claims made by the affirmative. He, he, Colton basically claims that graduation rates will drop if we have a voucher program. However, the graduation rates, excuse me, will rise. However, the graduation rates will actually drop considering that those still left in public schools and not accepted by vouchers have been declining since 2010. And how can we make sure that the right students get these vouchers? There are certain students that are willing to work and certain students that are not. There is no way to guarantee that the students who deserve these vouchers will be able to receive them. Also, he mentions that paying for two schools is not fair for the students that are in these, for the parents of these students. However, this isn't entirely true, as taxes are always going to be taxes, whether or not they go towards private or public education. However, the use of public funds through the state fund for schools should not be allowed to be used in private or faith-based schools. Thank you. Cole, thank you very much. Colton, your two minutes for questions and cross-examination begins now. Go thank ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Cole, just to ask you about your last thing that you said, um, you were talking about how private public money going into a private source is very unconstitutional. Uh, being, as I said in my speech, that this is not just a case that affects Colorado, it affects the entire United States, do you believe that this will go to the Supreme Court and they will make a final decision on whether or not it is constitutional? Actually, Douglas County has appealed to the Supreme Court. However, the evidence seems to lean towards the Supreme Court of Colorado, as it shows that America is a free market, therefore the government should not interfere with business, and therefore inter interfering with a, free, with a free enterprise, such as a Catholic school, a Lutheran school, or a private school in general, is just not allowed. Uh, you also talked about uh, the declining graduation rates in public schools upon using a voucher program. Is it at all possible that public schools realizing that they have to step up their game to compete with more private schools will possibly increase their graduation rates or just try to promote a better product for their students? Public schools have actually been stepping up. However, with the declining graduation rates, that is in no part due to the teachers or the administration. The students left at the, at the public schools that have not been able to receive these vouchers feel defeated. They feel like they had this chance for a great education and they were ultimately declined. This private education seems like a promised land and they weren't allowed in. 
Um, you say that public schools have been stepping up their game, but at the same time you said that, edu that the graduation rates have been declining for the past couple of years. How do you reconcile these two things? Because the students aren't trying and the teachers are. No matter how good a teacher is, that doesn't mean that the student will want to learn. No matter how much water a, stu a teacher has to pour into the student's cup, if it's upside down, nothing's going to stick. Um, in your first contention, you talk about uh, Colorado consistency standards and how we must determine these things by ability and not by a lottery. Don't you think that the voucher program is probably available to some reform in which we do determine it by ability? I think that a reform would be amazing, but as it is now, vouchers are simply not the answer that we need for the education system. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Well, Colton, you now have two minutes for a rebuttal here. Have at it. Oh, thank you very much. In my first, uh, my, in my opponent's first contention, they talk about how Colorado needs to be consistent with its education standards. This is not going to be done by not allowing the voucher program as there is a vast disparity between people getting an education in the public school realm and people getting an education in the private school realm. This, this is a very deep kind of uncanny valley we have here and voucher schools help close it, help kind of build a bridge and help people to get a better ed education. Um, and I asked him in the previous cross X if reform was possible and he said yes. And the fact is that when we look at the fact that school vouchers have allowed increased graduation rates, at least in all studies, and there's no studies saying that it has had a negative effect, we can just uh, assume that it's a good thing to have, being that it has had positive effects and it can get better. We're on the first step on a stairway upwards, really. In my opponent's second contention, they said that vouchers threaten public schools. Um, I believe I'm going to have to hear my opponent's clarification on this, but there has not been a single public school closed down as a result of vouchers. He talks about how they don't help the poor, but they make a bigger separation. But again, he's ignoring this uncanny valley between the public schools and the private schools. And by closing that, we can greatly help people to just come together and try to end separation that is happening in places where people have to go to school close to where they live instead of going to a school that offers the best education. Um, when he attacks, he talks about how graduation rates are declining and they will continue to decline as a result of vouchers. I do not believe this is a case. I believe that public schools will have to step up their game as a result of vouchers being introduced into the system and produce a competitive nature of schooling, offering lower prices for better education and producing higher graduation rates. Otherwise, public schools that flounder in this market will have to simply cease to exist. And so those students who went there previously will have to attend a bigger, better school that is receiving more funding. Thank you. Cole, thank you very much. All right, Cole, you have three minutes now to respond and close. Go ahead. Thank you. My opponent seems to live in a world where public schools are the devil to the education system. He claims that public schools just can't be effective and any student that applies for vouchers is doing so because they want to go to the promised land of private school. However, he also manages to think that graduation rates will not decline in public schools. Well, which is it? Will public schools be good enough to not decline in graduation rates or will they plummet and fail? He also mentions that it's a completely rational thing to think that all public schools will just close and everybody will have the money to pay for a private school no matter how cheap. However, this clearly isn't true. Public schools, were a, public schools were essentially a founding part of America, coming in the first 50 years of its incarnation. Public schools have been a part of our history, and they're what makes education so accessible to everybody in the nation. He manages to think that any, any school that is close or in proximity to a family can't be effective. And he believes that these graduation rates will stay the same and the voucher program will somehow save the public school system. This simply isn't true. In fact, the public school system will plummet. If all these students are leaving the public schools and taking their money with them in part because of vouchers, public schools are going to lose more and more funding and not be able to operate things such as their special ed programs or other special interest programs. They won't be able to take care of students that need it the most. And in fact, this is quite an abominable thought. He also mentions that public schools uh, are being abandoned and that how they'll just shut down if they're not doing well enough. However, imagine a world with no public schooling. America's education system is already deplorable, only ranked 24th in the entire world. With closing public schools, it would no doubt plummet and nothing good would come of this. 
as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, not only would uh, Colorado deserve consistent standards for all students, all students deserve a fair chance in this voucher system. We both agree that the lottery system isn't the best way to go about things. So why implement an unfair advantage for some students until it's been reformed? Why not wait until we can find a way to base these things off of student achievement, such as a test or an interview? In fact, reform should be based only on student ability and, student ability and achievement, and it should have nothing to do with chance. If it has something to do with chance, that is unfair to the students, to the parents, and the schools themselves. Suppose a private school accepts a student because of vouchers, and it turns out that this student just refuses to learn, refuses to take part in what's required of a private school. This, in part, would make him an, an, an inert student, and he would be useless to the community. In fact, it would be a waste of resources to try to educate this student because he wouldn't try at all. It should only be students who are willing to learn, who are willing to work, and who want to be in this education system that should be allowed into the voucher program. Thank you. Cole, thank you very much. And finally, Colton, let's have your one minute, one minute close. Go ahead. Thank you. I would like to quickly address uh, two things my opponent brought up in their last speech. He talked about how I was saying that the public schools are the devil, when I was clearly not saying that. I believe that public schools can provide a quality education. It's just I do believe there are also public schools that do not do this, and should those schools, school, should those schools start losing funding from lack of students and then pass into nothingness, I don't think that's a bad thing. I believe that school, public schools that are doing a good job giving quality, giving quality education deserve more students and more funding. That's what I believe, and I believe public schools can provide a perfectly adequate education. And then my opponent t talked about fair chances, and this is really where he loses today's debate, because he said that only students who have the ability should be allowed into the voucher program. And I agree, the voucher program isn't perfect. It's worth keeping in place, not just because of the higher graduation rates, but also because we can start rewarding students who work, who really try and deserve a better education than the one they are currently getting. And it's just the fact that my opponent doesn't want to get rid of the voucher program. He wants to reform it, just like me. It isn't, doesn't make sense to get rid of it. And for that reason, I have won today's debate. Thank you. All right, Colton, thank you very much. Of course, the question at hand today has been whether Colorado school districts should be allowed to offer vouchers to pay for private K-12 through education. Colton has had the pro. Cole has had the con. Let's go to our panel right now and get their thoughts on what they saw. Dominic, take it away. Thank you, Alan. This was a great debate, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to offer just a couple of questions for each of you. Uh, let's start with our affirmative case and our head coach, Jeff. Uh, yes, uh, Colton, you made an excellent point, I believe, in the idea that parents are paying twice, in effect, now uh, if they choose to send their student to a, a private school. And yet, uh, the amount of the vouchers that uh, can be offered by school districts, would that really pay for the entire amount, or is, does this really just result in a subsidy to the rich who choose to go to private schools? Uh, no, I think it results in the exact opposite of a subsidy for the rich. I think the main point of vouchers is to offer people in positions who really can't pay for the 10,000 a year tuition of a private high school to really kind of get in on the ground floor, so to say, and really offer them a chance to get a better education. Okay. Let's get a question for a negative case. Tom? Uh, Cole, d don't you think that without competition for tax dollars for, um, for the schools, the public schools will, will lose their incentive to improve or become complacent? Absolutely not. I think competition is actually very important. However, vouchers are not the way to go about it. Vouchers are just essentially getting rid of students from public schools because they're leaving and with vouchers they're taking that money with them. Public schools are losing funding and they're doing everything they can to improve but the students simply refuse to learn. And we're going to need a few seconds here to decide uh, who uh, won the debate. It's obviously a, a tight affair, but uh, give us a second. It's a tough one, that <laughs> is for sure. And it's great to hear high school students debating something so close to education right mm -hmm. here. As they consider who won, let me let you know this is one of eight different debates we're presenting this season. To check all of them out, you can go to cpt12.org forward slash election. All right, panel, I hope you're ready. I didn't give you much time there to make the call, so do you have a decision? Uh, we do indeed, gentlemen. It was a, a very tight affair. Um, we uh, enjoy the argumentation from both sides. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to make a decision, and we decided that the argumentation we heard from Cole won the day. Uh, and I, I think folks who uh, are arguing for vouchers in the future have you to fear, have to fear <laughs> you if you are uh, going up against them in the future. So, uh, um, but congratulations. Thank you, sir.
All right, Cole, thank you very much. Cole, Ricky, congratulations to you. Also, Colton Barton, great job on this debate. You both gave our viewers a wonderful debate tonight. You both ought to be very proud. You know, go on to defend St. Mary's against Jack Cohen from Denver East's forensics team on Friday, October 14th, 9.30 p.m. You'll see that right here on CPT12, the next round. It's all we have time for in our program tonight. I want to thank our excellent students for accepting our challenge and participating in our debate. I also want to thank our esteemed panel for sharing their thoughts. And finally, thank you for tuning in. It's the support of viewers like you and our sponsors that helps make this show a reality. This is the second of eight episodes of Both Sides of the Story. Be sure to tune in next Friday at 930 to catch Cherry Creek High School and its debate about whether red light cameras should be banned in Colorado. If you're looking for more information about this program or about the Colorado Decides debate series, please go to our website, cpt12.org forward slash election or cbsdenver.com. And you can catch me every morning on CBS4 all, for all the latest news and information about this year's election and the issues for everybody here at Colorado Public Television. That's both sides of the story. I'm Alan Janay. Thanks for watching.